This is a viewer request video, which means I won't be going into extreme detail. I'm just trying to help somebody out who has a test soon, and hopefully it'll help some other people out as well too. Uh, this person asked me to do a little uh, review on nephron physiology, and in their email they asked uh, about the renal corpuscle, the tubules, low anatomy, a little brief idea on filtration, reabsorption secretion, the juxta glomerular apparatus, that's a tough word, that includes all those things there. So let's get started. Uh, we'll start off with a little brief anatomy. So brief anatomy. There are two parts. There is the renal corpuscle and then there is the renal tubule. If you look at a nephron, we look over here on the left hand side, you see all the yellow tube system, you see the blood vessels around it, uh, the blood flowing in and all that. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of stretch out this nephron and just make it look like this over here on the right. And you can see the tubule system much better and also remove the blood vessels that are on top of it. Okay, so the first part is right up here. It includes two parts. There's the blood flow that's going in. That is the afferent arterial. And then there's the blood flow that's coming out. That is the efferent arterial. You can just think of it like E for exit or A for approaching. So uh, this part right here that I circled is called the renal core Puzzle. I'll just abbreviate it there. The renal corpuscle has two parts to it. It has this big word that everybody has a tough time saying, including myself, glomerulus. All right, so it has the glomerulus, and it has Bowman's capsule. Bowman's cap, or Bowman's capsule, that uh, is also called the glomerular capsule, has another name to it. So uh, I just thought about it here and made a little analogy. It's kind of like a light bulb. Uh, if you look at the green part that's around here, that would, let me change the color. The green part would be this outer part of the light bulb here. And then the inside uh, little filament right here, that would be the glomerulus. And you could think there's the afferent, that one's coming in. And the efferent, uh, that one would be going out. So just, just like a different way to uh, think about. There's several analogies I have for this here. So that first part is called the corpuscle, corpse. Uh, this corp is a body, so it's a small body, a corpuscle. And that body has two parts: the glomerulus. Think about like a light bulb; it glows. So just that part there, and the capsule, just named after some guy going in. All right, so. Uh, now we also have the renal tubule system. Excuse my handwriting, I know it's horrible. But the renal tubule system has pretty much three parts to it. You have your PCT, which is this part right here. You have your loop uh, Fenley, that's the part right here, it goes down and up in blue. And you also have your DCT. Okay, so CT stands for convoluted tubule over here and also over here convoluted tubule. They're proximal of distal, proximal mean close, distal far. If you look all the way back on the left, you see everything's messed up. Well, it's talking about proximal in relation to what? What's that area called right there? That area is called the renal corpuscle. So proximal to that, that's the proximal convoluted tubule closer. And further away in terms of flow, that's going to be your distal convoluted tubule, convoluted. Convoluted just means all around and twisted like that. So we got both those parts. Now your loop of Henley has two parts. There's the part that is going down. Would that be descending or ascending? Well, that's going to be the descending part. And then there's the part that goes up. That's going to be your ascending part. So that's a little brief anatomy. Now let's continue on and talk about filtration. So first, filtration. Where does that happen? Filtration happens here at the renal corpuscle involving the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. So let's just talk an analogy first about what filtration is. Yeah, let's say you know, it's the morning, you're going to wake up, you got to pour a nice pot of coffee. So uh, you pour the water up at the top. Of course, you have some fancy coffee machine, but let's just talk about basics. So the water goes here. You have the coffee grinds. They're all inside here. And then you have some filtration that's coming out here. 
So what went through? Was it the water or was it the thick pieces of coffee grounds? Well, it was the water plus a little bit of flavoring. The whole point is here, small things went through, not large things because they couldn't fit uh, through that filter. So one thing to think about here is the force. What's that force that's causing the filtration here in our uh, coffee uh, example? Well, that's just going to be the force due to gravity. Okay, well, that's not the same idea that's going on inside of our nephrons. Because what's going on here, okay, the blood flow is coming down as this arrow shows. And then we're going to have filtration of small or large particles out here. Well, small. All right, so, for example, large proteins can't pass, such as albumin, that won't go through. Blood cells are too big, they won't go through. So you shouldn't be finding that in the urine. But water and small salts, uh, sodium and all that. Okay, so what's the pressure that's forcing uh, all these small particles out of the glomerulus? Well, it's not gravity. It's what we call, I'll write it down here, blood hydrostatic pressure. It's basically, it's just blood pressure. This is a fancy way, you know, water, stationary, hydrostatic. But it's just a fancy way of the same blood pressure. So what, what's going on here? Well, look at a hose. That's another example I like to use. If you think about a hose, and let's say we're going to put a couple holes inside the hose, like this, you know, hole here, hole here, 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 and the water's flowing through. So, you know, what, what's going to happen at those holes? Well, the water is going to get out, right? It's going to be forced out of here. So just picture that hose is like a glomerulus. It's like a capillary, and there it is. It's getting uh, forced out. So that blood hydrostatic pressure, that's uh, the force that is forcing the water out and into the first part, which is going to be the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, so let's talk about another force. Let's say now this coffee part starts to fill up, fill up. It's getting up here, all right? It's making its way, and it gets to the top. What's going to happen now when we get up here to the top? Well, it's going to force, uh, it's going to cause another force going in the other direction, and that's going to be going up that way. That's just the force of that full pot pushing the water back in the opposite direction. So that relates to the pressure inside the green area here in Bowman's cap. So when Bowman's cap starts to get filled up, we call this capsular hydrostatic, I'm not going to spell it all, same thing, hydrostatic uh, pressure. So we can abbreviate that CSHP. So that's going to be pushing in the opposite direction, pushing up. And then there's another force that will be pushing back as well too. So let's say when it's filled, and why, why didn't those uh, particles such as red blood cells and albumin and all that not go through? Well, because it's simply, they were what? They were too large. So this is going to cause a very high osmolarity inside of here. This area is going to be hypertonic in relation to below the filter, which is going to be hypotonic. So this area here shows you that the force of the water is going to want to be backwards towards the area of high solute concentration from low, hypo, to high solute concentration. So now we got two forces wanting to bring that fluid component of the blood, the water, back into the glomerulus. So that force there we call the blood colloid, it's referring to particles, osmotic pressure. Well, we'll abbreviate that blood colloid osmotic pressure. We can also abbreviate uh, the other one, not to confuse it, as blood hydrostatic pressure. Now there's an equation here that tells us what's the overall force of the filtration going to be. And it's called net, N-E-T, filtration pressure. Net filtration pressure equals blood hydrostatic pressure minus the sum of capsular hydrostatic pressure plus blood colloid osmotic pressure. But what's the way to think about this? Picture you have this big guy right here. 
All right, this big guy weighs 60 pounds. Then you have two smaller guys over here. You have one small guy right here. He weighs about 25 pounds. And then you have another smaller guy over here. And he weighs about 15 pounds. So together, they have a combined weight of 40 pounds. So 40 pounds versus 60 pounds, who's going to win? Well, the 60 pound guy is going to go and he's going to crush those guys. So uh, overall, what's his overall force? Well, we take the difference, 60 and 40, giving us a net filtration pressure of 20. And it's blood pressure, so MMHG, millimeters of mercury, just like systolic or diastolic units. So net filtration equals about 20. Where are those numbers coming from? Well, blood pressure usually drops by half from 120 systolic down to 60. And it gets down to the glomerulus over here, so it's coming in at about 60 mmHg. And then the two forces that you have going back, the colloid osmotic pressure is a little bit higher at 25, and this is here at 15 mmHg as well. So let's just talk uh, pathology for a moment. We mentioned earlier that what small or large things will go uh, through the glomerulus. Well, small because they can't go through the filter, right? The filter filters out large things, stay behind, and the small things go through in water as well. So one thing, if there's something wrong with the glomerulus, you're going to find blood cells, for example, uh, inside of the urine. The other thing we're talking about here, net filtration pressure. What would happen if this guy didn't weigh 60 pounds, but instead, let's say, he weighed, I don't know, let's say 35 pounds. So if he weighed 35 pounds, these guys are 40 pounds, they're going to go back against them with a net force of about 5 pounds, which means blood would be backing up uh, into the glomerulus at about 5 millimeters of mercury. Obviously that's bad because you know we're not getting filtration, we're not balancing all our electrolytes and everything, so that's a pathological condition right there. So would that be caused by hyper or hypotension? Well, Hypo, because hypo meaning low blood pressure. Let's discuss one more equation. This one is GFR, glomerular filtration rate. Well, what's a rate? Something you measure over a time period. For example, how fast you're traveling, 60 miles an hour, 100 miles per hour. I hope not, but it's just a measure of a rate. So here we're going to be measuring the rate of filtration, and the units would be m L per minute, milliliters per minute. The average value is about 125 mLs per minute. So let's picture this. What does this really mean? Well, 125 mLs per minute, let's, let's say just randomly, let's just multiply it by 10. So that says in 10 minutes, we produce a little bit over a liter of urine. Okay, what about in an hour? Let's just get a better idea. Okay, so let's just multiply this by 6 to find out how much we do in an hour and that would be uh, over seven liters per uh, urine in an hour. Now think about that. Do you really produce seven liters of urine in an hour? How much is that? Well, say you're thirsty, you buy a soda bottle. These are two liter bottles, right? That's going to be more than uh, three of these two liter bottles. So there must be an answer. Something else must be going on to prevent us from going to the bathroom that much. And that comes here, between reabsorption and secretion. Which one do you think that is? Well, let's talk about it. So, let's just rewind for a moment first. Filtration. Where did filtration happen? Well, it happened right here, at the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. Collectively, we call that what? We call that the renal corpus. So on the renal corpuscle, we have the renal tubules. As you see, there's the first part that's coming out here. We call that the what? That's a proximal convoluted tubule, the PCT. It goes down and it continues, becomes a descending loop of Henle. And then it goes up and becomes the what loop of Henle? Ascending loop of Henle. Then it continues over here. You can see it in white, becoming the not proximal, but distal convoluted tubule and then the collecting duct. Something I forgot to mention is the nephron does not include the uh, collecting duct. The collecting duct 
joins the several other nephrons, jo joins other DCTs of these nephrons. So this picture, you know, you have another nephron here, you have the proximal convoluted, the descending, the ascending, the distal convoluted, then it joins their DCT. So you have, you have a bunch of DCTs here connecting to one collecting duct. So if filtration is happening at the renal corpuscle, reabsorption and secretion are happening around the renal tubule. There is quite a bit of detail about this, but I'm going to try to touch upon it briefly so you just have a general idea. Okay, so let's zoom in. We're adding the blood vessels in right now. We call these the paratubule capillaries, or some more specifically we'll call the vasorecta. Not something I'm going to uh, get into much detail about right now. So let's just look at this nephron. Let me look over here. Here, right here, this is uh, Bowman's capsule right here. This represents the glomerulus. Here's the afferent arterial. Here's the efferent arterial. I'm just stretch, uh, stressing the letters, afferent, efferent. And what's the name of this process again called that's going on here? Uh, that's filtration going on right there. So we get filtration. Now, as substances go through here, the PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule, down the descending limb of the loop of Henle, and then back up, there's reabsorption secretion. Which one is going to be the movement of particles into the blood vessels that are surrounding the loop of Henle? Is that going to be reabsorption or is that going to be secretion? Right, well, we're reabsorbing it back into our bloodstream. If we don't reabsorb it, it's going to keep going along the whole tubule. Let's call it the urine roller coaster slide or whatever it's going. And it's going to go end up in the toilet, down and out. So if we don't want things to go down and out into the toilet, we got to reabsorb it back into our blood vessels so it stays within our system. If we don't want it, then we got to secrete it into the tubule. So that, that there would be secretion. Here's an analogy to think about. I know I'm a horrible artist, but just pretend, you know, here's a sink, right? And you're holding the strainer, and there's holes in the strainer right here. You got a bunch of pasta in here. You're dumping the water on top, and a uh, strainer is going to have water come out of here, right? The pasta is going to stay in there, because why well, I want the pasta to go through. Well, it's too large, right? So water will go. This is a sink right here. I know it's horrible. Uh, here's the opening to the drain of the sink, and if you ever looked underneath the sink, you know, it goes, eh, kind of like that. What do we say? What's the word for a twisted something? It says it's convoluted, right? So you have your proximal convoluted tubule, and going down here. But let's say, I don't know, somehow you dropped uh, an engagement ring, right, for a fiancé, well, or that you got from your fiancé, right? And so the ring's in here. Well, you don't want it to end up and go into the sewage system. You want to somehow get in there and you want to take it out of there. You want to reabsorb it. You want it back. So do we reabsorb useful things or wasteful things? Well, we reabsorb, we want it. It's useful, right? If you don't want to keep it, at least sell it for money. And we secrete, which means, let's say, you know, I want to throw some other things away. Of course, the sink, just drop it down the drain. But just for analogy, you're going to secrete it back into there so it can go down into the sewage system. So it's you know, not necessary anymore. So down here, that's our sewage system, right? Going to the toilet, and then over here, we're reabsorbing back into the bloodstream. Let's scroll down a little bit and take a look at this image. If you need the image, I have the link for it right down there. But let's uh, take a look for it at it right now. Okay, so we have over here Bowman's capsule. The glomerulus should be in there. We have the proximal convoluted, the descending, ascending, distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. So they didn't draw the blood vessels in here, but you just imagine the blood vessels right here. So reabsorption is happening back into the blood vessel. If you look, a lot of things are being reabsorbed. Sodium chloride, potassium, water, bicarbonate, glucose, amino acid. So the majority of reabsorption is happening where? It's happening in the PCT. And what about secretion? Well, you can see some secretion happening over in the PCT as well too. You have creatinine, antibiotics, diuretics, uric acid being a big nitrogenous waste. So that's being secreted in there as well too. But let's go all the way to the other side and we see the distal convoluted tubule. We got potassium, hydrogen, urea. So there's a lot more. So the majority of secretion is happening in the PCT. 
the majority of reabsorption is happening in the PCT. Do they happen at both locations? We'll look at it. Yes, reabsorption is happening at the PCT as well as secretion. But which one's more reabsorption? And if we look at the distal convoluted tubule, what's the majority here? Well, there's more secretions happening over here than it is over in the PCT, but there's still reabsorption as well too. Now, here's a point that I feel gets many people. Now, the loop of Hentley does focus a lot on water reabsorption, but the majority of water reabsorption is not happening here at the loop of Henley. Where do you think it's happening? It's happening up here at the proximal convoluted tubule. About 65% of water will be reabsorbed by the proximal convoluted tubule. So the remaining percentage will be throughout here, but a majority of the remaining percentage will be here through this loop of Henley. And take a look at it. Is it on the descending limb or is it on the ascending limb? Well, look for the water and here. It is on the descending limb. What's significant and important is that the sodium chloride is being reabsorbed on the, the ascending limb. So let's scroll up here. Take a look at this diagram up here again. Alright, so the majority of water reabsorption in the loop of Henley itself is happening where? It's happening in the descending limb. It's being reabsorbed here into the vasa recta. Vasa, or uh, the veins, or vessels, and recta meaning they're straight, because they're going straight along the loop of Henley. Okay, so it's happening here in the descending limb, but not in the ascending limb. You have sodium reabsorption happening over here, sodium chloride as well. So why is this happening? Why the descending limb? Why the ascending limb? Like why, why is it happening in each place? Well, let's look at the histology of these structures. Let's take a look at some cells of the descending limb of Henle. Well, when we look at the cells of the descending limb, we call these the flat cells. What are the flat cells called? They are the squamous cells. You should draw some more here. Right. This would be the direction of the filtrate that's going through here, and it's going to be taking a turn, and it's going to be coming up here. Now let's look at the cells that line the ascending limb. They are actually thicker. They are more cuboidal in shape. So it's progressing up here now. So over here we have our descending limb, and over here we have our ascending limb, more cuboidal cells. So let's take a look at one of these cells here. So it's more cuboidal, so it must have something more in it. Well, again, you guys know how my drawings are by now. What is this organelle that's in here? That's supposed to be the mighty mitochondria. So there's a lot of mitochondria in here. If we have mitochondria, what does that mean? What are we trying to produce a lot of, right? Mighty mitochondria, ATP. This is energy. If we're energy, what kind of transport do we need to do? Passive or active? Well, hey, we're doing active transport. What are we going to be actively transporting? Well, let's go back over here. We're going to be actively transporting or reabsorbing sodium. Now, sodium is the main thing, but there are other pumps here. You've got sodium, what's K, potassium, also chloride. It's actually two chlorides at a time. And it will be really absorbing uh, all these solutes out. Now, just on a side note, loop diuretics act against this transport pump. Why is this important? Well, if we're going to be reabsorbing a lot of sodium chloride out here, so let's go back over here. So we got a bunch of sodium chloride. We're reabsorbing it. It's out here. It's in the interstitium. And you can see the values of the osmolarity, 1,200, 1,600. Well, how does osmosis work? Osmosis is the movement of water. So again, let's have a little beaker here. Here we go. All right. Fill this up. Here's water. Let's divide this a little bit. Let's put a bunch of solutes over here on one side. A few solutes over here. 
Which way is the water going to move? It's going to move to the area of higher solute concentration. So with all this solute out here making the osmolarity very high, now the water can passively flow out over there. It can't over here because we got all these tight junctions and no aquaporins are going to release the water, so water can't come out here. But the sodium chloride will. Sodium chloride can't come out here because we don't have those mighty mitochondria, those big cells to pump it out. As you see here, the filtrate's coming down in this direction, down and around and up. But the blood is coming down and around this way. So as you can see, I know that red probably is not the best color, but they're going opposite directions. The blue arrow is going up this way, the filter, which represents the filtrate, and the blood's going in the opposite direction. So they're going opposite currents, opposite ways. So this is called the counter current mechanism. So we reabsorb the sodium chloride first, and as we get over here, now we have a high osmolarity over here, the water will passively flow out of it. But again, where does the majority of water reabsorption happen in the nephron? It happens here in the proximal convoluted tubule. So what happens when we reabsorb more water? Well, if you reabsorb more water, there's going to be more water in the blood. And with more fluid in a pipe, there's going to be more pressure. So the pipe being the blood vessel. So if we reabsorb more water, we're increasing blood pressure. So if we backtrack a little bit more, you reabsorb sodium and uh, that will increase the solute concentration which means we're going to reabsorb more water increasing the blood pressure if we try to uh, block these channels here with the loop diuretic drug that means we'll act to decrease blood pressure because we won't be uh, reabsorbing sodium which means we won't be reabsorbing as much water let's try a few simple questions down here First one, where does the majority of solute reabsorption happen? Well, think about it, pause it, but I'll just go ahead and tell you. That's going to be the proximal convoluted tube. Where does the majority of solute secretion happen? Think about it. That is going to be the distal convoluted tube. But does secretion also happen in the proximal convoluted tubule? Yes, just go back up here, look, and you can see there's still secretion. Does reabsorption happen in the distal as well too? Yes, it does, but the majority of reabsorption happens in the proximal, and the majority of secretion happens in the distal. What about the majority of water reabsorption? Where is that going to happen? you got to be careful. That's also going to be happening in the proximal convoluted tube. But where else is water reabsorbed? That's going to be the loop of Henry. Collecting duct is not part of the nephron, but that's a piece at the end I was mentioning earlier. And it's going to be receiving input from what part of the nephron? Well, if you see here, we're receiving from the DCT in here and here. A bunch of other nephrons will be joined to it. What about this last true false one here? The thick ascending limb of Henley reabsorbs water. Well, this is the way I, I try to think about it. How do you know which portion is the thin one and which portion is the thicker one? What did it mean if it was thicker? Well, it meant it was cuboidal in shape versus what over here? Versus squamous in shape. Why was it cuboidal? Because we had the mitochondria. Why did we have mitochondria? Because ATP. What did the ATP provide? What type of transport? Active transport. So look, A, ATP. A, active. A, what? A, ascending. So what was being actively transported out? That was our sodium. So that means in the descending part, that's going to be our water. So going back to this question, a thick ascending limb of Henry reabsorbs water. No, that's not correct. So this one here is false. Now we will continue to the last thing I was asked to discuss. And that is the juxta lamellar apparatus. Juxta meaning nearby or close. Close to what? Close to the glomerulus. The glomerulus being the blood vessels right here. Apparatus, what's the apparatus? Golgi apparatus, Golgi body, Golgi complex. 
It's just a bunch of things together. Okay, since it's a bunch of things together, what are those bunch of things together? It's really two things that make up the apparatus, that make up the body. It's these granulosa cells, also known as juxtaglomerular cells, and those are the green ones that you see here, and the macula densa cells of the distal tubule. But what do we call the distal tubule? We call it the distal convoluted tubule. When you look at these cells, they're a little bit taller, they're a bit columnar in shape, these cells, right in between uh, these two black lines I drew. Just to give yourself a gauge of where we are again, we're down here at the renal corpuscle, the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. And why, why is this the distal convoluted tubule that has these cells? Let's go over and look at this nephron. So we have Bowman's capsule. We have the proximal convoluted tubule that goes up and wavy, comes down the descending loop of Henle, the ascending loop of Henle. And sometimes people say it's part of the ascending loop of Henle. Many books say it's just a distal convoluted tubule. But right here, this distal convoluted tubule is right nearby. What's the word for nearby? It is juxta. It is juxta glomerular. And this is why these are part of the juxta glomerular apparatus. So that dark area I drew in here, that's going to represent this area right here. So it's just these tall columnar cells. If you look, the rest of them are cuboidal, but these cells make up the macula densa. So what are the two parts? Well, one is the granulosa cells, which are also known as the juxtaglomerular cells. And then the second part here are the macula densa cells. Where are they coming off of? The distal convoluted tubule. Where are the juxtaglomerular cells coming off of? Well, if you look here, it says afferent arterial. A, it's going in, right? The blood is going in this way. Efferent, or exiting, it's going out that way. So the majority of them are here on the afferent arterial. There's a few on the efferent arterial as well, though. How do I remember which cells are where? Again, I just do letters. I take the D in densa and the D on distal. So distal densa which leaves the afferent arterial to have the juxtaglomerular or granulosa cells. So why is it called granular cells? Well, if it's granule, they must have little granules inside. What are these granules? They're some sort of protein. What is this protein? It is renin. So renin is inside these granular cells and that's how I remember renins in the granular because these are granular so that means they have some granules that is the renin as opposed to the macula densa it's dense it's compact they're tall that's the reason for being in the macula densa so why is renin important and why would it be secreted the short answer is it would be secreted in response to low blood pressure if there's low blood pressure, then there's an increase in the secretion of renin, then there is an increase of blood pressure. This could become a lengthy discussion, but I'm just trying to briefly touch upon it. But what happens are these macular densa cells are sensing a low blood pressure. Reason is because there's not much solutes here in the blood, not much sodium chloride. There's a low blood pressure, that means we have a low filtration. If there's low filtration, then there's not much solute being pumped into the filtrate. In other words, there's not much solutes or salts inside the renal tubule. So if we can't filter a lot, then we're not going to get much solutes in here. So by the time it makes its way to the uh, distal convoluted tubule, there's not that much in here. So these macula densa sense, right? Densa, sensa, let's remember that, okay? Densa. Sensa, just a little mnemonic here to help you. The macula densa sense a low sodium level. And so they sense this low sodium level because there's not much uh, filtrate being produced because there's a low blood pressure. So they send a signal here, and these granulosa cells are going to release the renin, which will increase the blood pressure, which will increase the sodium in the tubules, and then it will relax and slow down until it reaches a homeostatic level. If you're interested to learn how this renin system works, it's called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, it's quite detailed. This is a good diagram 
I have the address from the Wikipedia page down there. But basically you have angiotensinogen. Anytime you see that ogen, it means something is inactive, like trypsinogen, for example. And uh, so the liver secretes it. Read it when it's circulated. Uh, we'll find it and convert it to angiotensin 1. This is the angiotensin converting enzyme. So it will convert it to number 2. And when it's number 2, it's going to do a series of different things. The big major thing at the end is going to act to increase blood pressure. I hope this information was helpful and will help you in your tests and exams and anybody else watching this video. If you want to see more of the videos, I'm trying to put a bunch more on my site. It's uh, profroots.com. I just started building it, so just give me some time here. Also, you can email me directly at jrufael at gmail.com or you can find me at Facebook. I'll just put in John Rufael. Thanks and best of luck with your exams.